Greetings, my name is Christina Hernandez Guerrero and I currently oversee the public and campus programs at the USC Pacific Asian Museum in Pasadena, California. I'd like to thank all of you for joining today's program, Conversation at PAM, Collections Highlight, Thai Silverwork, and Decorative Objects. For today's conversation, please keep your microphones on mute for the duration of Dr. Hall's presentation. We will open up this conversation for questions once Dr. Hall has completed her PowerPoint. Now, before we begin our program, we would like to pause for a moment of silence to acknowledge that Pam was built on the sacred land of the Tongva Nation. During this moment of silence, we remember and honor the Tongva and all indigenous people. Please take a pause to honor these ancestral grounds and celebrate the resilience and the strength that all Indigenous people show worldwide. And now it is my pleasure to pass this program along to our director, Dr. Bethany Montagno. Hello everyone and welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I am Bethany Montagno. I am the director of the USC Pacific Asia Museum and I really want to welcome you all. And uh, I think to, I, to kind of piggyback off of what Christina was just saying about strength and resilience, I, I think right now disruption has been our constant companion this year. So we, we have really been asking ourselves a lot about resilience and expanding the edge of change. How do we, how do we recover, persist, and even thrive right now in the face of change as we kind of shift out of the pandemic and back into life again? And I think the way we do that is we look to history and we look to art, and there's so much resilience in art. The resilience of art and art-making practices that have persisted for thousands of years is really our place of refuge that we're trying to go to. I think at the museum and with people who love art just like yourselves. And so it becomes our place of inspiration so that we know that we're not alone in this moment or across time. And so here to kick off our 50th anniversary uh, USC PAM programs and talk to us about a very resilient art making practice is our curator, Dr. Hall. I'd like to welcome you. Go ahead. All right, well, thank you. Um... Well, okay, I just want to say first before I start, uh, this is the final day of the, the Thai New Year. It's, it's a, a New Year that's celebrated over several days in, in, in Southeast Asia, in Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar. And so I just want to say Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, it's a tough New Year for a lot of people, uh, but it's still a really special time of year in that region. And you guys will see, I use the opportunity to pretend like I am in Chiang Mai, <laughs> which uh, would be wonderful. So, all right, I'm gonna share my screen with you. And um, so I'm gonna talk to you today about, about some objects in our collection. I first, I just wanna say thank you uh, to Christina and for everyone at Pam for inviting me to talk to you about Thai art today. It's actually one of my favorite subjects, but something I don't get to talk about very much. So I jump at the opportunity to do this. Part of what makes the arts of Thailand so enjoyable to study is the beauty of what we often think of when we think of Thailand and we think of the, the Wats, the Buddhist temples and the spaces that they create for communities. It's golden and colorful, filled with playful figures and acting stories and demonstrating possibilities within the Buddhist uh, realms of existence. And I find it very easy to get lost in the architectural details, uh, like what you're seeing on your screen here, of temple buildings and of murals and large uh, golden Buddha images and JD, things like that. And we do have some really wonderful Buddhist art at Pam. Um, I decided not to talk about this when I was talking about some collection highlights because I want to talk about things maybe that are not uh, as visible in our collection, but aren't these wonderful? I mean, we really do have a small collection of things from Thailand, but we have some really, really great things. And so while I do really love the arts of Southeast Asian Buddhism, 
I am going to spend time looking at objects that we don't have in our galleries right now. It doesn't mean that we won't have them in the future, but there are things in our collection. And as we're moving through our 50th anniversary year at PAM, it's something that we're thinking about is what does our collection represent overall? Um, what are the things that we have in our collection that we don't see as much of? Uh, how can we talk about those or bring them into uh, galleries or activities or different things that we do? So I'm gonna talk, oh, I'm gonna talk about, uh, I don't have a picture of it yet, <laughs> but uh, I have this instead to say that usually what I study, just to give you guys a sense of who I was before I was a curator at USCPM, is uh, I look at arts of ritual and, and the arts that people use in Buddhist practice, uh, arts that people make that kind of show their love for their practice and, and kind of adhere them to Buddhism. Uh, these are things that are often overlooked um, for the, the, the golden things that I was just showing you. But I look at textiles that embody Buddhist belief and the objects that encourage Buddhists to make merit um, so that they can be reborn in heaven. And I think that there's a similarity between these things that you see on the left side of the screen and the decorative art uh, things that I'm gonna talk about today, because I feel like they all serve to embody uh, the ideals of, of people uh, in Thailand. They embody the ideals of Buddhists um, practicing laity. They embody the ideals of people uh, and their place in society. And so there's this great connection. And as you can see on the right side of the screen, you see a row of monks and they, you see that there are objects that they have in front of them. And so these are kind of the objects that tie everything together. And I just think it's really important to think, it would be misleading to think that flashy architecture and golden sculptures are the only arts of importance that come out of Thailand, or even that they most closely embody the Thai spirit. So instead, looking at the objects made for and used in ceremonies or in the lives of the elite in the 19th and 20th centuries, objects that people interact with on a personal level or something that they use regularly, we can learn a great deal about how Thais once viewed status and how many Thai people uh, use these objects they surround themselves with to communicate their place in society. And so this is status, right? That I'm talking about how objects can reinforce codes of status. Um, and when I talk about status, I'm referring to social, professional, or other standing uh, of someone or something. Then we have objects, clothes, and works of art that are tied to status in the past and today in cultures and communities uh, uh, around the globe. So by taking a closer look at some of the vessels and containers that we have in our collection that were embraced by the Thai elite, definitely in the 19th century and in, in parts of the 20th century, we can gain insight into why these things look the way they do and why they have connections to status in Thai society. So let's look at the photos that I'm showing you guys on screen. What do you see in the photos besides the individual people sitting for their portrait, right? Because what we're seeing, we're seeing um, late, no, mid to late 19th century peak at uh, Thai life, uh, elite Thai life in Bangkok. And you see people, but there's so much more going on here, right? Um, let me think about this. Uh, what do you see? You might see what they're wearing, right? I am a person who comes with a textile background. So of course I'm gonna be looking very closely at what people are wearing. You might see the way that they fashion their hair and how that's very distinctive to uh, Siamese identity at this time. Uh, but what else is there in these photos? These objects on the table that might get lost to contemporary viewers who aren't really reading the images um, uh, in the way that somebody in the past would have looked at them. But it's these objects that I just wanna call your attention to. And these small objects on the sides of the photos have great significance and are the kinds of objects I'm talking about today. You can think of them as utilitarian objects made with great care. They're made with expensive materials for uses such as serving and drinking tea, the application of perfume, etc. These arts are often referred to as minor arts or decorative arts because of their role as functional objects as things supplemental 
to daily life and special occasions, right? They're decorative uh, and they have survived over time. The ones we have uh, are saved in museums and in private collections. They're usually luxury goods um, reflecting kind of the elite members of society made from the finest of materials by artists working at the top of their field. In other words, these are luxury items made to display wealth and status, and they connect to the royal family, or at least to traditions that were started and embraced by the royal family in Thailand. And not just in Thailand, but in surrounding places as well. I just, you know, it's been so long since I've talked about this stuff that I thought, well, I'm just going to throw a map in there. It's usually what I do when I'm talking about Southeast Asia, because even though I know it really well, I should never assume that anybody else does. And so what I talk about the Bangkok and how what I'm talking about today is really centered on Bangkok. So this is where Bangkok is. We've got this huge country is culturally different. It's historically very different depending on where you are in the country. Um, and, and so for those of us who, who love and study Thailand, we get really into the nitty gritty. I spend a lot of time at the top of the country. Uh, I'm really excited to go back to town so I can spend some time in the northeast of the country, but that's irrelevant. What I want to show you is the capital is down here. And so when I talk about Bangkok, this is what I'm talking about. Uh, and if I mention southern Thailand, you know it's on the peninsula here. So, um, And so many of the Thai objects in museum collections reflect class in Bangkok, or upper class life in Bangkok. Ordinary people's belongings were simpler, made of less expensive materials, but their functions were were quite the same. Uh, shapes and materials and styles varied outside of Bangkok and different regions of Thailand, but something that might be made out of silver and lacquer in the capital would have been made perhaps out of wood or uh, basketry, but still had similar uses when you get outside of that region. And, uh, and so that's something that's shared across, across the country. The finest objects were owned by the royal family and they were made in royal workshops and presented as gifts to important people. Even until today, the Royal Palace in Bangkok has its own group of artisans who can create the finest materials that then they can have for the royal family or that the royal family can hand out. So they have goldsmiths and silversmiths, mother of pearl, inlay artists and jewelers. Looking at the photographs I have on the screen here, it's clear that we're seeing it's clear on the right anyway, um, that we're seeing images of kings. Thai kings are the ultimate highest members of Thai society and proximity to the king is only given to the most elite members of society. Beginning in the 19th century uh, and especially with the influence of, of King Mongkut, uh, also known as Rama IV, he's the guy you see on the left and continuing with his son, uh, King Chula Lungphon or Rama V on the right, Thai kings surrounded themselves with regalia and objects that served as visual reminders of their unique status. So in the mid 19th century, as European influence comes in and as we get the advent of photography, we start to see how important these objects are for display. And so as photography becomes this important medium for documenting royalty, we see setups like the ones on the screen and in these old photographs where they make sure they have these objects next to them um, as part of their pose. Um, right, the objects, uh, our, our royal regalia, we have the crown of victory, which you see on Rama V's head on the right. You have a royal staff. You'll have a fan and a fly whisk and royal utensils, weapons, and slippers if you are looking at an image of the king. And so all of those things are in these photographs. They serve to kind of remind us of the king's power. And royal utensils are actually pretty amazing because they are for the royalty, but they are the same things that you would see used in, in other uh, capacities by other Thai people. There are four royal utensils, each made of gold for the king. Uh, and so the material that it's made out of is one of the reasons you know it's not for a regular person. You have a betel nut set, a water urn, a libation vessel, right? A vessel for water libations and a spittoon. And those sound very ordinary, right? Even if you're not entirely familiar with things like betel nut chewing, a spittoon, we all know what that is, uh, a water urn. Um, and so it's really the materials and how they're made that makes them so special. 
And so then they convey wealth and status to a subject and they are identifiable to anybody who sees that photograph because the photograph then has the power of the king. You see the king and you're familiar with the objects that he has surrounding him, um, right? They show us who he is, they show us that he's special and they're always placed next to the king's throne during royal ceremonies and they are personal. They have his insignia and rank on them. He doesn't share them with anybody else. Um, but King's advisors and people who are very important and high rank in the court will be given a replica set of the King's royal utensils when they are promoted. So you can see how this all wraps together. Um, and when you start from the top, you start to see right these things and how important they become when maybe when we're looking at them without knowing that we don't really see it as much, right? So then you get people like the first photographs I showed you of elite Bangkok, people who are probably connected to the king, but not closely, but maybe the objects they're showing us came from the king's orbit, right? So then they communicate their status that way. And we, uh, we can understand how um, important objects like this become. Um, let's see, I'm gonna find those photographs again. So this is what I'm talking about, right? You can see then that these objects in, uh, become more important than you realize. These people are elite, they're able to afford the finest things from the silk textiles to, to these incredible silver and gold objects. So now I'm going to turn to the objects. I'm giving you a little bit of context for everything. Oh, I keep flipping around. So this is what I was talking about. I couldn't find really good images of the royal utensils. This gives you a sense of what I'm talking about. Uh, I was water libation vessels because water is such an important part of Buddhist ceremonies and pouring water. Uh, is important. I, we don't really have any of the silver ones in our collection, but here are some examples of libation vessels in clay. And what I like about this is it also shows you that again, when I'm talking about silver um, and the more elite materials, you can still find most of the shapes of everything that I'm talking about in other materials as well. And here are some, some other elite members, but you can see again, uh, they're wearing these incredible textiles, but what do they have next to them? Tea uh, things, tea things. What is that? Tea things, isn't that funny? I do this every time I present you guys, I can forget words easily. Um, but you can see again, that these women have, have these uh, objects next to them. So I talked about beetle nut, beetle nut uh, paraphernalia and how that actually is an important uh, type of vessel that you'll see in collections and then also in photographs. And so I just wanted to kind of show you guys these beetle nut sets and talk about what I'm talking about because beetle nut was once a very common, um, beetle nut chewing was a very common activity in South and Southeast Asia um, for a very long time. It was chewed by women and men of all classes. And it's only in recently that it's kind of disappeared as a practice. Uh, it was a betel nut is actually an areca nut from an areca tree was wrapped together with other min in ingredients uh, such as a mineral lime, which is a calcium compound, tobacco and spices in a betel leaf. And so you can see on the left side of your screen, all of these different things together, right? So you're not just sticking a, um, a nut in your mouth and chewing it. This whole thing has to be wrapped together and then put in your mouth. So it takes this kind of ritual action uh, to get to the point where you can chew the beetle and it's a stimulant. Uh, and you can even see some of the objects here that are not in these fancy materials, but are still the same things you would see again and again um, in collections and in the photographs I was talking about. Um, so the beetle nuts, the stimulant, the other ingredients add flavor and create this kind of reaction that makes the beetle nut what people love to chew. And beetle nut chewing was very popular. Residents, um, uh, residences of the aristocracy would have a beetle set in each room together with a spittoon because when you're chewing beetle, you have to spit, right? And so that's what the spittoon is that we're, I was just talking about um, and a tea set. So all of these things would be together and they're always there in the room for people to enjoy. Members of the elite would have their servants carry their beetle net sets with them wherever they went. And the quality of the set was an indicator of a person's status. If the set was made with silver or some other valuable metal, we have examples with gold. Um, it would show that the set's owners were high ranking people. The higher the rank of the owner, the more elaborate the set. Objects included the beetle, um, 
objects that include beetle net sets were also presented to officials by the king to thank them for their services. So this is a very common gift. It would have been given at a wedding. It would be exchanged between families uh, who are arranging a wedding ceremony. And, um, and it could be in a variety of materials. So I'm showing you one on the upper left that is silver with gold. I'm showing you some on the lower right that is brass. And so just to give you a sense that the materials can vary quite a bit, but it's what is included in them that becomes important. And again, if you go to somebody's house and they have this incredibly fine example, it gives you a lot of information about who they are and their connections. So we do have beetle nut related things in our collection. We do have quite a bit of beetle nut related uh, cutters in our collection, but that is not what I'm presenting about. But I did want to show you that we do have some of these wonderful things. Uh, here is an example of a beetle uh, cutter. And you can see some of the fine silver work that has remained on the handles of the cutter. We have a beetle, uh, beetle nut leaf dispenser here on the right, which is silver, uh, like a repoussé. Uh, so we do have some wonderful examples of that. And I think it's really great. I'm kind of peering into the collection to see that we have these things because I do think that they're so important and show this fine craftsmanship that was important for something that used to be quite common. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the materials and, 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 and some of the offerings. I mean, some of the, um, the objects in our collection that relate to the things I've been talking about. Here you see an offering tray in the Pam collection, and you can see that I took these photographs. <laughs> so some is a common thing at, at, at Pam that we don't have photographs of a lot of the things that um, we might be interested in. So I love Annie Lee. She'll she'll dig them out for me and and stop all the work that she's doing so that I can take photographs of it. So I was just at Pam last week doing this, and you can see this beautiful offering tray. Uh, I think it's really quite an exquisite piece. And it has all of these details, right? Floral images, which are so integral to the decorative arts that I'm talking about today. But around the rim, um, around the tray itself are these little birds and flowers that you can see in the lower right, which is upside down, but you can see the birds. So there are birds scattered throughout this and then this engraved kind of center. Silver has a really long history of use for royal regalia and religious objects and beetle sets in, in Thailand, right? Um, which is really interesting because there are no silver deposits or silver mines in Thailand. So everything made out of silver has to have come uh, as an import. Uh, so its history is a history of trade as much as it's a history of, of, of regalia and royal use. Um, the Ayutthaya Chronicles, and Ayutthaya is the kingdom before this one, because it was not a Thai history lesson, but it's, the <laughs> uh, so the previous very powerful kingdom was called Ayutthaya, and they had chronicles that talked about how kings would grant insignias of rank made out of gold or silver to their chief ministers. So we know even before the uh, 19th century, even before the late 18th century, that this kind of practice was common. Um, but it's really in the 19th century that we see this, this practice of having silver utensils and different kinds of decorative arts taking such an important role in understanding status and display. So here we're looking at something, um, different techniques were used to create the silver. Oh, here's the base of that beautiful tray. I really, really love this thing. Um, but we have different techniques that are used. We have repoussé. Um, objects, which is a very, um, it's a very popular technique in Southeast Asia. Um, and discussions of repoussé talk about the different places where it was used and where it's very popularly made. One of those is Chiang Mai, which is where the temple is that I'm standing in front of. Um, repoussé is a technique in which the designs are re represented in high and low relief. So they almost look like they're embossed. You can see kind of a sense that it's not a flat surface. Um, and this is believed to be a very old art in Thailand, and it continues to be quite popular today. Uh, and it remains popular in part because it's cheaper and less time consuming to make and purchase than some of the other techniques that we see used with silver. Um, there are even parts of cities where they, the used to be the old silver working area, and you can still go to them and see people who have maintained that tradition. 
repoussé is this technique of shaping and decorating metal. It's actually a, an ancient technique that's not unique to Thailand, but is a, used extensively around the world. And it's something that you see just kind of becoming popular with the history of metalworking. Parts of the design are raised in relief from the back um, with hammers and punches. And then the definition and detail can be um, added from the front by either chasing or engraving. So they work both sides of the metal to get these fantastic designs. And repoussé is actually a word from French that is means to push forward. So even the word itself kind of describes uh, the technique. It's something used often with other techniques to get an even more sophisticated and fantastic um, surface. So here you see repoussé being done, not literally today, but being done in contemporary times. Uh, and so here you see bowls uh, very much in terms of Buddhist practice. You will see um, Buddhists going to the temple with their silver embossed bowls or repoussé bowls like this. Um, to make merit and to do the different activities that are required of them. And then you'll see them being used in different ways as well. At the bottom, you'll see that that is a beetle set, right? So I just wanna show you that it's not something that dies out, but it is something that is continued now. I love this. This piece from our collection is actually quite small. I think it's like two inches. I was so, I mean, I, was, I had read the size, but it was so great to see such a tiny little bowl with such delicate, um, detail. So this is one in our collection. I put this in here so you can really get a sense of the way that that surface is worked um, from the front and from the, I mean, from the inside and from the outside, that it's not a smooth surface either way, but you can really see how, how the technique of working the silver really becomes part of the identity of the, of the object. Um, so silver is this nice, beautiful, expensive material. I mean, isn't it wonderful? It, it tarnishes, but you can shine it very easily. And the ones I always see actually in use in Thailand are just, they look a lot like that, right? This beautiful, beautiful material. Um, and it's something that is, is relatively common uh, across Thailand, as long as people can afford to purchase it. It's also mimicked in other materials. It's so it's something that has been used by the Bangkok elite, but certainly is more widespread. Then you go to another technique that gets used. And here's another bowl from our collection. Um, and this is the technique of Niello wear. So Niello is uh, the ancient art of applying a, an amalgam of metals to carved portions of silver objects to create silver and gold patterns against black backgrounds or vice versa. The niello part of this niello wear is a combination of sulfides, copper, lead, and sometimes silver. So it's this, I'm gonna call it a magical process, but actually really it's the scientific process of heating up materials together. And I'll have a picture for you guys in a minute um, to create, and so it's very precise to create images that look like this, right? So they heat them together until they form a compound. And the exact proportions of the three materials can vary and it will completely affect the colorization of the coloration of this kind of surface, depending on how they combine these materials. Proportions, uh, then they, they uh, use dark metals, they apply to the etched portion of, of the silver receptacle to create a silver pattern against a black background. It is really quite striking. And what I, ours, you can see has a little bit of damage to it, but what I like about that is that you can actually see that the surface is in fact etched. And then you can imagine that the black that should have gone in there and how that works. So I really like that even though it's not a perfect surface, it really shows you that technique. So here, here you can see it's this a very laborious process, but it results in this incredibly detailed and stunning surface. And so it uses part of what I was talking about with the repoussé, where you have this beautiful silver bowl that then you then kind of create this embossed uh, etched surface that then you add the amalgam to, um, to create this beautiful black um, and silver surface. It's used in, in Thailand to decorate trays, containers, beetle nut boxes, teapots. Well, that's what they're called. They're called teapots. Um, vases, jewelry, and other, other small objects. So it's used for a variety of things. And the object itself is shaped and formed before the niello is applied. 
Um, so then the yellow is kind of one of the last process steps of the process. The object to be decorated must have a silver content of at least 95% for the yellow mixture to adhere properly. So it tells you that this is not a process that you can, uh, like you cannot adjust it. You cannot uh, decide to use a less um, fine substance. And so it really is kind of very, remains an elite art because of that. Um, in the past, artists would use chisels to etch the designs, but today it's more common for them to use acid to accomplish the same purpose. So tying yellow is made by shaping the object of silver um, and then shaping it just like you see. Um, it's heated to create a compound that is combined with sulfur and then allowed to cool and harden. And then when the blended compound dies, it has dries. It has a black color with a light blue luster. And then it's usually kept uh, in the shape of rods. So here you guys can see this, this thing that he's kind of shaping. That's the niello before and it's added to the surface. Okay, I'm not gonna go into great detail about that, but you can see that it, it creates these fine, fine surfaces. And so it really does take an incredible amount of expertise to make. Once complete, the, the pieces fall at polished, right? To get this beautiful uh, shiny surface. And in fact, this is not a technique that is unique to Thailand. Either uh, people who, are, who study decorative arts or are familiar with this process will tell me uh, that it actually has been known in Europe for over 2000 years. Um, and we, we aren't sure how it came to Thailand, but most people kind of seem to think that it came from the Portuguese um, who were in Thailand by the 16th century and, uh, and were influential um, in, in, in bringing this technique to Thailand. But some argue that in fact, it is uh, the Thai tradition is actually derivative of what was done in Persia, which is very believable because the Persians had a very strong influence in, with trade uh, in Thailand around the same time. And those people argue that it's evidence from the designs and patterns of the Thai pieces um, that really we can see this connection to Persia. And we do have really strong connections between what was called Siam in the time uh, before now uh, and the Islamic world in the 16th century. And that this really did impact the trade and arts in, in Thailand. And, and so I just think that it's really interesting to think we have two very different places, right? Portugal and Persia, and we can make arguments for both to have had influence on this technique, uh, which is not indigenous to Thailand. And we do have records that talk about yellowware use in Thailand that date as early as the 15th century uh, in Ayutthaya, that early year capital, uh, and very much a center of trade in Southeast Asia. Um, we know that royal laws during, uh, during the reign of King Boroma Trilokanat in the, in the 15th century decreed that a nobleman of certain high rank was entitled to govern a city and demonstrate his exalted position, position by owning a yellowware pedestal and tray. So again, we see even written in Chronicles that important connection between objects like this and status, and not everybody could own them. Um, and this is reiterated several times in the 17th century. We know that uh, King Narai sent a yellowware gift to King Louis XIV of France. So again, seeing this connection between Thailand and other places and the importance of this type of object as a gift for status. Um, so it's not that surprising looking at these and, and really these are some of the finest examples because they incorporate gold into their service, but it's not hard to imagine that this would be something so popular, uh, but only refined or reserved for the elites. So. I just want to say that I'm focused on the silver um, and those objects, but we do have ceramics that function very much in the same way. And we do have some examples in our collection. These are not, these are not PAM objects, but here we have um, a type of ceramics called bencharong. And it is a ceramic that was originally made from in China for the Thai court. It is a, a unique type of enameled porcelain. And you can see um, that is very much filled with Thai uh, images and designs. And these were again, imported and made at the, at the Imperial Kiln site in China. So you know, this is again, not something that was accessible to all. Uh, it's something that becomes very popular in the 19th century uh, and into the early 20th century. 
And you can see they are the same types of shapes of the other objects we're talking about. Um, and so I think that that is just something really great to iterate. So Ben Jarong is basically a five color porcelain. And it's a, it's a name that comes from Sanskrit um, that says basically five colors. Not all of them have five colors. It doesn't have to be that literal. <laughs> but I just wanna give you this detail, again, not of a PAM object, but just to give you a sense of what these really wonderful, wonderful ceramic objects are. Here we have some, and I don't have, um, I don't have a like overhead view of the one on the left, but this gives you a sense of, as we get into uh, the later part of the 19th century and in the 20th century, these objects are actually made in Thailand. They become more accessible and, and to a larger market when that happens, but they remain very popular. And so we do have some wonderful examples like the two here. And this one gives you a sense of, of the surface um, from the top. And so this is another type of tray that you can imagine holding some of the things that we've already talked about. So uh, it's often quite floral and it's got the five colors. And so I say that they have tie designs. What exactly does that mean? One of the things you can look out for is this like Ranok, um, which is a flame motif. Uh, and you can see that in the bowl here, right? And it's just this, fills the space with this kind of floral sense of floral space and it almost looks like a flame um, or like a vine you know but it always has this flame point on it and it really is something that you'll see on a variety of different kinds of things architecture textiles ceramics and silver in thailand so that's something you can expect to see in these decorative objects and here you see on this wonderful example that we have, again, the surface is filled with this like or not. You also get something that I absolutely love, which are the mythical animals. Um, and our example from Pam has that. You can see the, uh, the figure is, what is that, right? Do you guys have any idea? It is in fact a mythical animal that is a lion with an elephant head. It's called a, co a cocha si. Um, and, and these animals are very popular. They are related to Buddhist cosmology, um, which I'm not gonna get into here. Maybe that's a whole other lecture, uh, but I just think it's so great to see them. I, I am a big fan. And then on the bottom of the same bowl, we see a, a, a lion. And you can tell that you can just tell the differences because of the shapes of their heads and the, a lot of the animals that come from this this really special forest in Thai um, Buddhist cosmology have this hybridized appearance. This is not one of our bowls, but I just wanted to show you some other examples, the Kinari. And if you go to Thai town, you'll see Kinari on the top of light poles. Uh, so maybe you're familiar with that. It's very popular. The Nora Singh, which you see. Um, a lion body with a, like a human uh, top half, right? The kinari is a bird with a human top half. You have Tepanom and Tewada, which are um, like celestial beings. And so they often, these animals and these figures are reminders of the heavens that can await people uh, who are dedicated to Buddhism and, and gain merit through proper behavior. And so all of this stuff is wrapped in together. Um, the motifs are important, the shapes are important, the materials are important, but really, uh, you know, I just want to kind of break down some of that and show how a bowl can be a bowl, but a bowl can be a lot more than that. So at the beginning of my talk, I say that we can gain insight into why Thai decorative objects look the way they do, uh, why they are have a connection to Thai society and status. And we can look at these vessels closely uh, and see how they're embraced by the Thai elite. And I'm doing it very superficially today, but even doing that little bit, it helps you to kind of break down and understand a little bit more about what you're seeing when you're seeing some of these old photographs and getting a better sense of Thai society, what, 100, 150 years ago. So by talking about the role of beetle nut, beetle nut containers of silver vessels, yellow wear and bench wrong, you can see that these objects have this brilliant combination of outside influence, right? Because we see manufacture in China, we see potential influence through trade and this development of techniques, but how they are quintessentially Thai in the way that they look and the motifs on their surface. And so 
These objects um, then become important in displaying an individual status, but also telling us about Thailand um, in the past. Much in the way that the Thai king displays vessels to reiterate um, to reiterate his really unique status. Um, excuse me. Um, Thai elites had similar objects to show their proximity to the king because if the king is the most powerful, right, then how close you are to the king then becomes very important as well. So like the golden threads and the beautiful trade textiles that were worn by these members of society um, so that everyone who saw them knew immediately of their roles, the vessels used for beetle chewing, perfume wearing, and tea drinking served much the same purpose. And luckily these objects have survived to give us a glimpse into society and art in the 19th and early 20th century. And I think it's really wonderful that we have some examples um, at USC PAM. So that's a little bit of insight into Thai art and culture outside of what you might expect to discuss and see. Um, that's pretty much what I've got for you guys. I don't know uh, if you wanna open it up for questions. Sure, so if anyone has a question, feel free to unmute yourself and address Rebecca directly. If you're feeling a bit on the shyer side, you're able to type in your question using the chat box, which is at the bottom um, part of your screen. I have a question. This is Annette. Um, would Dunsett Palace in Bangkok have a lot of examples of the the different styles. Yes, <laughs> I mean you can. Gosh, I haven't gone to any palaces in Thailand in so long. But I would I would presume if they are available for display that that you would see them and that absolutely in the palace coffers you're going to find the most magnificent examples of all of this material. It's funny to me because I, in the past, I would have overlooked it. Like I fell in love with Thailand because of the textiles. And then I like, guess you slowly learn about objects that unpacks what you're looking at and you pay more attention. So undoubtedly they're going to have examples like this um, and much finer than the ones that we have at Pam. But if you go to the palaces, I would think, and to the museums, like, a, oh, my well, brain. I can't call, I can't come up with anything in Bangkok today. <laughs> well, Dunsett Palace is where the, before the um, current king, uh, the king who was in power for a long time and was really revered as a god. Ramanine. Okay. And he, uh, he and his wife really set out a thing where they were collecting um, the best examples of all the handicrafts throughout Thailand and collected them and put them in there. And I was wondering if the things you were showing us are also current arts as well as uh, historic uses. They are. And in fact, the queen, Queen Sirikit, um was instrumental in that, uh, in maintaining and, 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 and ensuring that these traditional arts survive. Uh, so she, so she really had a great impact on the survival of things like this. And we know that Niello wear and silver work continue, uh, but not in a large capacity. Um, you don't have, well, it really varies. You know, I was reading a book that was just published and they were bemoaning the loss of silver production and how young people don't want to apprentice with silver work. And I'm not convinced of that because I know where the silver workers are in Chiang Mai and I see that it is continuing. So I think it's just on what capacity, but you are absolutely right that Queen Sirikit was instrumental in that. There are I have another question. Oh, okay. If else does. Um, the Ray Pose wear looks like, in general, it's fairly thin because it looked like they had a carved. A uh, wooden pattern, and that they were pressing the silver against that to create the design. Do, is that what they always do, or sometimes they do it? They just work it from inside and outside. It's both. I think it depends on what's being produced, or where and how, or for whom. Uh, the cost, right, of production. 
so the the thing that yeah the thing that we saw that looked like an object that was made maybe for tourist market mm -hmm. that you saw in that picture and that is really important because I mean, that's part of what helps sustain this practice in thailand now i think it really depends i think it would be all of it i mean i think that you would have certainly i mean if i was a silver worker i'd want a little a little extra help <laughs> it's a lot of work but with the niello where then for instance you're not going to find that you know it's a much right. more uh expensive process i know there's two questions in chat i just don't know i don't think i can answer either one of them <laughs> do you know if there is or was any perceived nutritional or preservation benefit in making food containers out of silver and you know probably but in terms of my bias i never even thought i never even thought to learn that so i don't know for sure maybe 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 you do um Eleanor, <laughs> maybe somebody does, um, but it's not something that I know about. I get so focused on my favorite is like the motifs, right? And the, the surfaces. Um, and then does silver as a metal symbolize something in particular in Thailand? And again, it has to, right? But that tells you I get my bias and that I have no idea what, I have no idea what, but silver does take on this really important role and meaning in terms of I think because it is not something that is uh, made and produced like silver comes from outside and then is created uh, in these shapes in Thailand. I'm sorry, you guys. Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> sure. I got a wild guess. Oh, good. Uh, I knew I knew like during the imperial point. period, the most popular form of money in China was silver. <laughs> and so it was used in a lot of international exchange. You know, and they even used like from the Americas, you know, the those Spanish um, uh, pieces of eight. That was kind of an international currency. So silver had kind of a, a prestige, you know, as an international currency at one time. Maybe that's connected. No, you're absolutely right. In fact, I think it's so great to think about the fact that the Spanish are bringing silver from Mexico and from the quote unquote new world, right? To from their colonies to the Philippines and then to Southeast Asia. And the, so uh, that colonial trade and then China, of course, it, you nailed it. You nailed it. If, 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 my, if I remember my Thai correctly, I think the word for silver also means money. Mm hmm. Yes, so. Tuktong. Tuktong, Donna. <laughs> <laughs> Great, it's true. Great. You guys are uncovering all of this, but that is absolutely the case. And in fact, I was reading about how they would bring in the money and maybe melt it down or use it for other things. Rebecca, I have a question that fits in the category of it, it isn't what you were thinking about, but but the donors of these um, silver pieces to Pam, do you have any sense of whether they were collectors of objects from Thailand as opposed, not, a, not a, as opposed, but as contrasted to collectors of silver pieces. So, you know, kind of an inter, a, a, a kind of an international collector of silver as compared to a lover of Thailand uh, collector. I can tell you that I'm pretty sure all the examples I showed you, if not all, most of them were from the Reese um, family. And, the, uh, and the, some of our other really great Thai objects come from them. So I think it's more where they're from. And then the, they also have great things from Thailand. They are really special donors to this museum in terms of what um, what we have in our collection from the Reese, R-I-E-S um, uh, family. And then also that they are continuing to support us um, now. So it is really special going through this and realizing that it came from them. Uh, so I think that it's, it's beyond that, but we often will see in other places where it is exactly that people are collecting very specific types of art. So the Ben Jarong, that ceramic that I was talking about, that's really, really special. Uh, you'll often find people just collecting that or looking at, you know, Chinese export ceramics and ending up with bencherong. So that is a common thing that you'll see. No, I love, because I love when it sucks to do a presentation and not know the answers to anything. But for me, I actually really love that because I only think about things in a certain way and it helps me see the things that I'm not thinking of and a more well-rounded way to look at objects. 
Are there any other last minute questions? I, yeah, oh, well, I just, I guess not last minute, but uh, Annette and I recently had a kind of a, a discussion about beetle nut chewing and so forth, which is not your normal conversation between friends. But it, I wonder how the lime part of this thing works in a silver beetle nut set. Because you would think that it would just like, destroy it i think less than it would other materials like i think that the wood and basket types of materials would be more impacted but silver well i don't know but i mean in my head i would think of silver as a non less impacted i'm not thinking of the right words yeah it depends you know when you're mixing it you're doing it in a small thing and maybe it just becomes the corroded section of your beetle nut. I have no idea, Kathy. <laughs> I'm only just thinking of what lemon, you know, a sterling silver is obviously different, mm -hmm. but I'm just thinking about what lemon juice does if you if you have out the fancy um, silver for a dinner party mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's not pretty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would imagine that, I guess, I have no idea. That is a great question. Yeah, because beetle nut, as we know, well, once it mixes with saliva, it's not, um, from our untrained perspectives, the most attractive thing to see. Uh, although, I mean, that's part of why it decreased in popularity is because like internet, as, as the globalism takes hold, right, local practices don't be, stay as popular because they are not as attractive. So if you look, well, for those of you not familiar with beetle, what it does is it turns the mouth uh, red. Um, and black and so wow. people's teeth over time are stained by that's what i'm talking about and so it seems really bizarre to us but in the past in beetle nut chewing places that was a mark of beauty and wisdom right and you just divorce our perspective from this international kind of eurocentric perspective and, and see that that was a completely different case in the past but yeah so it, when people were still commonly chewing beetle nut and you would they would spit you know and the ground would actually take on that color as well so it, it's not a neutral color well, beetle nut can be addictive. Oh, it's and um, you know that's part of the problem. Why the governments are discouraging the use of it, and it can also create health problems, much like smoking with cancer of the mouth, cancer of the esophagus, etc. It is, but think about if you want tourists and people to really embrace. You know, it's like spitting in general. We think it's terrible, but in places where spitting was just a common behavior, you have to relearn to become more for your international standards. So you can just, like, I agree, and it definitely has those issues, but you can see that it's wrapped up in such a larger problem, a larger kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, that people, was... people were like, I love Thailand, but I cannot believe I was always getting spit on by these people with black and red mouths, right? <laughs> that's not going to go over well. But if people say, I love Thailand, that people are so friendly and nice and they smile all the time, then you've got a golden combination. I mean, I'm, I'm sound very cynical, but I think I'm putting it into this very specific perspective um, for a reason. So, I mean, I don't know. I have walked down the street and seen people spitting beetle nut and been like, I just don't want to get hit by it. <laughs> Well, I think in general, though, the governments of many countries are trying to dissuade the use. Um, for example, even in Bhutan, there's some betel nut chewing. And, you know, I, in, the, in the market, you would find, you know, a little woman in the corner selling all the ingredients for betel nut. But, um, you know, it was kind of not a big in other words, it's sort of subtle. She, she wasn't doing it in a very public manner. Yeah, because it's already become a, that's not what we do now. Right, I was surprised to see it up there, especially because I, I've seen it mainly in India and Thailand and Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah. And so that now it's just not as common and you have to know, but it is something that was very common in the past. I think it all ties together our understanding of why it has changed so drastically and in the Pacific Islands too. So we get 
we got beetle nut chewing was very big in a large part of the world. It just was a very specific part of the world. All right, I think, yeah, right? I think we're, we're out of time, but um, I just wanted to take a moment to thank Rebecca again for leading this really interesting talk. I learned a lot. I also wanna uh, thank our participants, especially our docents. It's so good to see all of you. Um, I hope to see everyone at our next um, high, uh, collection highlight conversation that will be posted soon. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Yeah, stay safe. Great.